I'm going to talk to you today about um, a very specific project called the Embroidered Digital Commons. And I was going to talk about a whole range of uh, creative projects looking at the relationship between textiles and software and computing. But actually, because we're all taking part in the Embroidered Digital Commons and embroidering the term ubiquity here at the conference, I thought it made more sense to focus on this one project. So this is um, an embroidery of a lexicon, like a small dictionary of specialist terms. And the lexicon was written in 2003 by the RAPS Media Collective. It's Creative Commons licensed, and it's licensed to share, so I didn't even have to ask their permission, I could just copy this text. And the embroidery is a form of copying the text. It's a form of close reading, observing, making, and reproducing the text. And if anybody else would like to facilitate over a thousand people through five or six different countries, actually eight different countries, um, to embroider a four and a half thousand word text, you're really welcome to. There's no copyright on this idea. So you can see here in the picture, uh, the embroidery threads are balanced on a pile of books. And these are uh, some of the different subject areas or discourses that have contributed to thinking through this project. Uh, Sadie Plant's Zeros and Ones, uh, you may know the cyber feminist book, and Ada Lovelace's concept of poetic science has really influenced my thinking around uh, doing this project. And Floss and Art, free Libra open source software and art, uh, a publication looking at uh, creative projects using uh, free software, and thinking through craft. So thinking through the materiality of making, thinking through uh, the gendered uh, stereotyping of certain materials. You know, what do, we, what do we think in terms of gender when we talk about computing, or software, or hardware, or programming, or stitching, or woodworking, or metalwork, and the new um, hybrid uh, physical computing tools such as Arduinos and the hacker maker culture is starting to break down some of those gender stereotypes. Even though predominantly women have taken part in stitching ubiquity here at this conference. So I'm just going to run through some ideas and concepts behind the project and some of these ideas have come out through the, through the process of making this project. And um, so the first part of my talk will be primarily text and ideas, and then I'm going to run through um, about 10 or 15 examples of the lexicon where it's been stitched. So the first question people ask me is, what is the relationship between craft and code? How do they stick together? And the proximity of craft and code really begins with um, the Jacquard loom, um, binary programming of a loom that influenced Babbage and Lovelace in the des design of the uh, difference engine and the analytical engine. So there's a long history here which just comes, repeats itself again and again throughout the history of computing. I'm quite interested in open source and open processes as ongoing, unfinished processes. They're always unfinished, they're always un evolving, un unraveling, and documentation has to be ongoing. And in this way, objects and their processes are symbiotic, and they produce a series of work from each stage of the production process. So this isn't a linear production process, it's a more cyclical production process where the work is an excess of documentation and maps the ev evolution of ideas over time. So we know the idea of the commons historically comes from the idea of common land from the diggers in the 1640s, uh, reclaiming their right to common land um, when it was starting to be divided up and owned and people who had lived and farmed for many centuries suddenly had no rights to the place that they lived and grew their vegetables in. We have the idea of the global commons, of global resources, natural resources. We had a little bit of discussion about this yesterday. Um, but the global commons include uh, the Ant Antarctic, uh, the high seas and the deep sea bed minerals, the atmosphere and the space. 
We also have the idea of the commons as people, the common people, um, the notion of a multitude and uh, a, a kind of new idea of the commons in terms of globalization or um, the global commons politically. And then a, a well-used open source, or we should say free software motto, which is culture is something you do, not something you buy. And I think this is a really good uh, principle of the commons, and it brings us back to a social and experiential mode of, of living and working that isn't necessarily product-centred. So the digital commons invites open participation in the production and distribution of tools, culture, ideas, and knowledge. So you're familiar with all of these ideas, and I'm not going to go into them in detail, but I'm, I'm going to um, talk about Paul Barron's distributed network diagrams, which are here. So these diagrams were drawn in 1964. This is the answer to the brief, the, the um, American military said a brief to design a communication system that couldn't be broken for, the event, for use in the event of a nuclear war. And this is a bit of internet mythology, which is actually true, and Paul Barron mapped. You can see, let me see if I can use the layers. Up. We go, ooh. So this is a centralized diagram, a decentralized, and a distributed. Now these networks are network topologies. In a sense, they're abstract mathematical models and they can be used to describe uh, communication networks and social networks or potentially the, the, the relationship between the technical network and the social network, which is what I'm trying to map out through my work. So we know the centralized model. This is the one-to-many broadcast model. It's, it's the model that Brecht was trying to um, reinvent through imagining radios that would transmit as well as receive in the 1930s. You know, we don't have a model on uh, cooperation and collective practices here. Um, the decentralized network, I think, is the most social scale. We all recognize our friendships, our cluster groups. So, you know, one, we might all be at this conference, you know, this might be Viviana or Sol or both of them, and we've all come from our own different groups and networks, and hopefully we'll, we'll go back and talk to people about our experiences here. So these can be uh, communities of interest, they can be um, communities of locality. And the infrastructure that we are all working within is this distributed network. And the distributed network is this utopian moment where anyone can connect to anyone or we can all connect to everyone all of the time. But of course that's rather exhausting and doesn't actually happen. And I think really what we do is use, use this network, the distributed <coughs> network, in order to develop our social network groups. So there's been lots of modeling of maps and networks um, through the conference. And uh, the way in which I describe the Embroidered Digital Commons project is that it's a combination of, the de of decentralized groups participating in a centralized project using a distributed network. So, we'll go back to the digital commons. How am I for time? Okay, great. So, the concise lexicon for the digital commons is a lexicon of terms that poetically explores all of these concepts what it means to have digital space, digital tools, digital access within the ethics of the commons, within an ethics of common sharing and participation. And this is the list of terms in the lexicon. So you can see it's access, bandwidth, code, data, ensemble, fractal, gift, heterogeneous, iteration, journal, kernel, etc. And we get down from the third column to ubiquity. And out of these 26 terms, I think 20 have been <coughs> stitched and completed. About three are in production, and we just need one or two patches finishing. And then there's a couple that are left. So I'm going to uh, just 
tell you about um, half uh, about a dozen projects and where they've taken place and how they've been structured. The initial project was to bring together computer programmers, uh, software developers, and crafters, predominantly in textile crafts, for a shared discussion about the ethics of their practice, looking at how they work together, why they work together, how they make things, how they communicate, and how they distribute what they make. And of course, women have been working together collectively on, on horizontal, non-hierarchical uh, models of organisation, uh, problem solving uh, quite informally, um, but not, not um, coining it as innovation. So access has been stitched to Access Space, which is an open source, open access media lab in Sheffield, run by James Wallbank. And on Friday, they'll be having an exhibition of the term access and the term kernel, which they've stitched there, alongside the term code, which has been stitched at Bletchley Park. Um, and you probably know Bletchley Park is the um, British code breaking centre from the Second World War. And the National Museum of Computing is housed at Bletchley Park and traces the history of computing from the WITCH project to the present day. And the workshops that we held there actually used an electronic sewing machine where you can design your embroidery on a laptop and then connect your laptop to the sewing machine and it prints out the embroidery. But what's interesting about that process is it all became about design rather than making. It's a big question for the design conference and what, the, what constitutes design. But um, you can see in the background, in the middle picture, this is the HTML patchwork, which is a previous work that I coordinated. And it's a patchwork of 216 hexadecimal colours, each stitch with their own hexadecimal colour code. And that's now on display at the National Museum of Computing in their BBC and ACOR room. So Ensemble was stitched in a cafe in New Cross. Uh, I teach at Goldsmiths College. I teach on the MFA in curating. And um, I want to do something in my own locale, my own network. And uh, Ensemble is, is nearly complete. Fractal is, um, has been stitched through the Mr. Cross Stitch blog. He calls himself, it's run by Jamie Chalmers, and he calls himself a man embroiderer. And you can see here that um, someone stitched the decision making planning tree, um, which is actually quite a linear, I and mean, I don't think a fractal process. There might be some um, problem solving um, competing people that can advise me on that. I've looked at it quite a lot, but it's not very practical. But some people have really um, close read the text and taken the meaning of the language or the concepts of the text and tried to illustrate or expand on that or play around with those ideas in, the, in their design. This is a gift which has been stitched with two different groups of people um, at an open siunta, which is an open sewing circle in Sweden. In a, in the oldest Swedish textiles workshop in, in Stockholm, and also with students at the art school in Berlin um, in May, and that's been finished. And the art, the art students are exhibiting the, the whole uh, artwork as part of their end of year show as a, as a kind of network to model. So heterogeneous has been stitched by an artist as part of their own artwork. So my uh, sense of ownership or involvement in this changes very much from each project. In heterogeneous, the artist Carla Cruz um, ran a workshop as part of her project All My Independent Women in Vienna, and I've had absolutely no involvement with that at all. Uh, this is Colonel, the access space. And you can see that uh, the project has taken over and they've recovered the chairs and reconfigured the space and it's been a real catalyst for, for thinking about the, the textiles and the design of the space of the Media Lab and how it's used. And then in the last few weeks I've been working with Muztech, which is um, 
a group of young women programmers and coders and makers who run workshops and training sessions for women who want to get involved in technology but don't know where to get started. And they do Arduino workshops, physical computing workshops, they do um, coding and programming workshops. And for this project, we used uh, just simply a battery and conductive thread. And conductive thread is this just amazing, sort of silvery, beautiful thread that conducts electricity. And everyone said, oh, are you using Arduinos? Oh, are you doing this? No, actually, it's just an electrical circuit. It's just a battery and a switch. And it, in a couple of hours, you can start to embed electronics into your fabrics. And you know, this is just a really simple taster session. Um, and I'm sure you know, if you did a week workshop, you could come up with some quite interesting designs. So this workshop was run at Furtherfield Gallery in London, which is a, a gallery that investigates the relationship between uh, making online and offline and, uh, and social networks online and offline. And you can see here, um, testing the switches and the electrical current. And this project also took place just after the SOPA protests. And you can see a bad idea is a dead meme. I actually stitched that as a, um, as a grey on black, sort of blackout embroidery in, um, in support of the anti-SOPA, anti-PEPA protests. And this is Nose, and Nose was stitched at a European writers, women's writers network. Um, at Belgrade University and also at Chawton House Library in Hampshire, in, in England. And this was very interesting because I wasn't working with people who had a particular interest in technology, but they were looking specifically at texts. And this is a European conference that meets regularly to um, highlight, publish and archive, not in that order, let's say archive, highlight and publish, women's writing from across Europe. There's um, many ways in which women have um, self-published over the years, and one of them is through um, writing letters and having letter books. So women would write a letter, and they'd copy the letter into their letter book, and the letter would circul circulate amongst friends and people who are interested. And there's a whole network of circulating, circulating letters throughout Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Don't quote me on the dates because I'm not an expert on the literature, but I think that's right. It could be 17th and 18th centuries. So forms of um, distributing ideas and developing discourse uh, through copying and reproducing texts were you know, really a familiar concept to, to these uh, academics and had really interesting conversations. Quotidian is being stitched by an artist um, in Newcastle upon Tyne, and this is probably one of the most sort of beautiful and considered, although the um, photographs are very pale, but you can see she's incorporating binary code um, and uh, kind of symbolism into the, into the text. Now the term recension is probably the most complicated one. It's not really a real word, it seems. But everybody at the Digital Humanities Conference in London knew exactly what it meant because they're looking at recensions of text again. And we're looking at recensions of code. And a recension is a form of repetition where something is not quite the same but different. And this changes the whole um, uh, hierarchy of knowledge model where as, a, as an academic or a researcher, you were looking for not for a single true original document but for versions of the document. And the nature of study or the nature of research becomes about comparing and contrasting and looking at different perspectives upon an idea. And that's where the knowledge lies, rather than a single true artifact. So again, there's a, there's a kind of paradigm shift from a desire from, for an object as the authentic thing that proves the truth to a more um, collective, um, way of seeing value in a collection of objects or a collection of ideas or approaches. This is um, the term site, which was stitched in Australia, uh, in Melbourne. 
Uh, the term tools was stitched in Manchester at the Mad Lab. That's another lab for the list of labs. Um, part of the AND festival. AND stands for Abandoned Normal Devices. Um, and that was facilitated by Art Yarn, who are uh, a group of um, kind of young hipster, crafter, tech um, people in, in Manchester. Ubiquity, that's ours, it's not there yet. But the next talk I do, it will be. Uh, this is Vector, which was stitched at the V&A Museum as part of the Power of Making exhibition. Very chaotic, you can see. Web is being stitched online through the Embroidered Digital Commons Facebook group, of course. It's just a document, it's really easy. You just log in, edit it, put your name against a phrase, stitch it and put it in the post to you. So some of these networks are remote networks and some of them are socially located and some of them are very specific communities of interest. This is yarn which was stitched at the Humlad and Bildmuseet in Umeå in North East Sweden. And this is Zone, uh, which was part, again, with, along with uh, tools, which is part of the Mad Lab workshop. So just a few closing notes about the nature of embroidery. I think that uh, it's, it's very easy to dismiss embroidery as um, a form of keeping women sitting still in the corner and not participating in public space. And if you look at most of the craftivist practices um, that are happening now, it's very much about bringing women into public space, into public discourse, so the content of the discussion and the content of the making is really important. And this is all about writing, all about literacy, and, and not about um, uh, preventing women from going to classes because they have to sit and stitch. It's a form of close reading and close stitching. It's also a form of reclaiming or rediscovering or remembering skills, which, you know, someone told me that this was a ridiculous idea to say that sewing is reclaiming a skill, but people do throw away shirts because they can't sew a button back on their shirt. You know, we're looking at a very extreme form of disposable culture around fabrics and materials, around the objects. So I just want to reiterate, like all collaboration, it's not compulsory, of course. <laughs> you only take part if you want to. And uh, another kind of critique of participation is that it's, it's this kind of false sense of pedagogy. But actually, I'm not inviting you to take part in this project because you're all people that are involved in a discussion about openness, about open methodologies, about the digital commons as a broader subject. So it should make sense to you. If it makes sense, you'll do it. If it doesn't, you won't. That's fine. I mean, I don't think I would do it if I was coming to this conference. I don't think I would want to sit and sew. So, you know, I, it's not an expectation. Um, and some of the more interesting discussions happen um, around people getting together and talking through the issues of the project rather than necessarily having to take part. But at the same time, it is a collective production and it's very exciting to be part of an international project of making where you can see your words starting to fit into the, the whole text. And I have another um, uh, talk, which I'm not going to give today, which is about non-violent direct action and about transforming uh, power relations at the point of power transaction and using um, textiles to do that. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I just noticed it's still on the end of my list. <laughs> so I'm going to finish up now and I'll be speaking this afternoon on a uh, kind of more round table discussion. So uh, you're welcome to ask me any quick questions now or save them until our conversation this afternoon. Thanks. Well, please, please stay here because we have got time for discussions. We've got a few minutes. We could maybe move over to the left there and we can just share the mic. Um, because I'll kick up with a question and then we really need you guys to throw some questions here too because I have an experience that when I'm working with people and they're making something, that the conversation is just as important as the making. And you, you also referred to that. Would you care to expand on that? Yes, and it, it might seem a bit contradictory to say this because the way in which we're making the embroidery today is quite individually and we're sitting in a conference uh, listening to people talking at us. 
and we're not necessarily having a, a, a very uh, focused group conversation. But I think the, um, yeah, it's really that the embroidered digital commons is all about the making of the work. And for me, the quality of the stitches isn't so important. Sometimes people treat me like the embroidery teacher and bring their stitches and say, Do you, is that okay, is that good? And I have to really, really check myself, actually, and check the, the language that I use and the values that I'm embodying in that exchange, because it's not about pleasing me. And I don't care if the stitches are brilliant or rubbish. It makes no difference to me. I'm interested in the, the quality of engagement and thinking that's going on in that process. Sometimes that's evident in a, in a, uh, a dexterity of making, but not always. Can I make a suggestion then that we have a stitch in around the round table downstairs and then other people can just eavesdrop on the conversation. That way we learn something. So let's have some questions from the audience here. There are some mics coming around because I think uh, Elle was, and I found her biography at last, so apologies I asked you to introduce yourself, but she's a curator, artist, writer and lecturer. But clearly she's worked in many different cultures and many different museums and other establishments, other cultural establishments. So, I welcome your thoughts there. Is there an angry stitcher in the audience anywhere? Well, are there happy stitchers in the audience then? Because I have another four or five questions, but that's not important. It, there's a happy stitcher. Viviana's a happy stitcher. Let's give her a mic. No, Viviana, just tell us why you're a happy stitcher, or tell Elle, that's more important. Yes, well, I'm, I'm a happy stitcher. Uh... I think because of that, I don't have a question because I've just been receiving everything happily while I was stitching. Um, I, I've just enjoyed the combination of hearing interesting things and the manual labor involved in, in stitching. That's been, it's been wonderful. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. I have to say that one of the embroiderers in Stockholm that took part told me that she was making a huge tapestry and she was making it in order to listen to the Nobel Prize winner's books that are in, on audiobooks. So she was using her uh, tapestry as a way of listening. And it was, it was a kind of year-long project. Could I ask you, because I've talked about slow design a lot over the last 10 years, and I think there's a kind of slowness to the stitch. And I think it's Betsy Greer of um, Craftivism fame that said, uh, make every stitch count, which is a nice little piece of activism, isn't it, I think? But you've chosen this medium of embroidery or stitching. Um, is that important? And is the speed with which it's made important? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Uh, yes, is <laughs> the answer. Um, yes to the slowness. I think, um, you know, thinking and learning, you know, if, you, if you're teaching, if you're doing a seminar, if you're trying to chew through different ideas, it's slow. It's really slow. And I think when it comes to making, we desire quick outcomes. And there is a continual frustration through this project. Uh, someone even tweeted yesterday, I can't wait to see the finished thing, you know. Everyone wants to see the whole text all embroidered, which would fill a room this size, it's huge. I mean, there are 26 uh, panels the same size as the one downstairs, some bigger, some smaller. And, um, you know, I, I should say that this is very much a voluntary project. I very rarely get funding to do it. Um, and other people taking part rarely get funding to do it. So it is a labour of love which is both uh, offers a kind of freedom, but also has its own problematics, um, its own problems. But um, the slowness, I think, um, yeah, it's frustrating, but I think that the experience of doing the HTML patchwork just showed that the work itself has to find the right context and the right relationships for it to make sense in the world like any artwork, and you can't be forced that. It's, uh, it's about um, building relationships over time. I think the short message is forget design deadlines. They don't matter. <laughs> or maybe I misinterpreted that. But Elle will be back this afternoon for our discussion session. So any other questions relating to her work or what's happening in terms of the participation, then that would be great.
So let's uh, thank Al for her contribution.